talk about politics and religion because that's what the book of Romans talks about. How we as Christians are to interact in our political system to bring glory to God, to bring justice. And we are part of what is called the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And our church body began because of a mixture of politics and religion. The founders of our church body were living in Germany in the 1820s, 1830s. And Kaiser Wilhelm came into power. And he, as a politician, started to take over religion. And politics got involved with religion. And the political system was telling pastors what to preach, what doctrines to believe in. And so the founders of this church body left Germany because of a mixture of too much politics and religion. And they came to America for freedom of religion. And so we're going to be talking about how we as Christians are to be involved in the political system. And if you can't take out your sermon notes for today, and look at the big idea. The Christian is to be the what? Best citizen. Being a little Christ in their nation. And we are going through a sermon series through the book of Romans. It's a wonderful book of the Bible about doctrine. And Romans is about righteousness, being right with God. And so let me ask you, are you right with God right now? Are you and God friends? Do you talk to God? Does God talk to you through his word? Are you in this community living out the message of love and mercy of Jesus Christ? Are you in a right relationship with God? You see, to be a, a good Christian citizen, you must first be a Christian. And being a Christian begins with being right with God. And this week there was an interesting story in the paper about a man who lived a lot of his early life not in a right relationship with God. And you might have heard about this guy named Louis Zapparini. Have you ever heard of Louis Zapparini? Okay, so some of you have, some of you have. But anyway, he was going to be the Grand Marshal in a big parade this upcoming, uh, when is the Rose Parade? Wait, no? That's right. Very good to know that. Okay, he was going to be the Grand Marshal, but he passed away this last week. And when he passed away, the things that happened in his life came out, and he's lived a very, very interesting life. As a young man, he was always in trouble with the police. Luckily, where he lived down in Torrance, there was only a police car, one police car. And so when the police car was in the north side of town, he would go to the south side of town to get into trouble. And running from the police, though, made him to be a very, very quick runner. And so he got into college on a running scholarship. And he went to USC or UCLA. I get those two mixed up all the time. They're about the same thing. But anyway, he went to one of those UT colleges. And won the 1936 went to the Olympics. And his roommate was a guy named Jesse Owens. Remember him? Okay. At the Olympics, he didn't get a medal, but Hitler saw how fast he ran, and Hitler gave him a handshake. How's that for a piece of history? Well, he was all set to go to the 1940 Olympics, and something happened. Who knows what happened? Yeah, World War II. And so, Lewis signed it for the Army Air Corps. He became a navigator in a B-24 bomber. And he was out on a mission looking for another bomber that crashed, and his bomber crashed and blew up. And he was one of three survivors on this little life vest, life vest, life raft. <laughs> and for two months, he was adrift in the Pacific, uh, gathering rainwater, catching sharks by hand, eating them. And then, luckily, he was picked up by a patrol boat. But the patrol boat belonged to the Japanese. And for the rest of World War II, he was in a prisoner of war camp, trying to be broken by this one Japanese soldier. But he never broke. Well, when the war was over, he came back a very broken man. And in your sermon, I'll talk a little bit about this guy's life. He wrote, I had nightmares every night. Uh, this is from a book, uh, Laura Hildenbrand. It's a best-selling book, Unbroken. Has anybody read that book yet? Okay, okay, might want to read this really good book. The nightmares followed Zapparini home, like a crazed hound from hell. No one knew about it because I looked perfectly normal, he said. I covered up my drinking. His wife, Cynthia, suspected something was terribly wrong because he would often wake up in a cold sweat shouting. 
One night he was dreaming about strangling the bird. That's his capture. In fact, he was on top of his pregnant wife with his hands around her neck, choking the life out of her. I woke up and couldn't believe it, he said. His life spiraled downward as he began to chase other women at local bars, where he and his Olympic buddies often got free drinks. I began to fall apart, he recalls. My wife decided that she wanted a divorce. About that time, a new couple in their apartment talked about a young evangelist preaching in the large tent in downtown Los Angeles. In those days, evangelists were dirty word because there were so many crooked ones. Can anybody guess who that young evangelist was? Yeah, Billy Graham was in town. And so his wife dragged him to a Billy Graham crusade. And after the very first night of that Billy Graham crusade, guess what Lewis did? He ran out of the tent as fast as he could. He did not want anything to do with being right with God. But then that next night, his wife dragged him back. And listen what happened. Something Graham said about people at the end of the road who turned to God triggered a flood of memories. He thought about his ordeal in the Japanese POW camp when he and the other men prayed daily. He promised God then, if you get me home alive, I'll seek you and serve you. What a heel I've been, he muttered to himself. Instead of heading for the next exit door, Lewis turned and walked toward the prayer room. There he fell on his knees and gave his life to Christ. The Holy Spirit came into my heart and became a member of the true church, the body of Christ. And for the rest of his life, Lewis would spend his life as a servant of God. And here he is with Billy Graham when he was older. And in the 19, late 1940s, he went back to Japan and he met his captors, whom he hated and wanted to kill. And he offered his Japanese captors forgiveness and mercy. His life was transformed by this message of love, this message of the cross. And that's where Christian citizenship begins, with us seeing God's love and God's mercy for us. And so the book of Romans lays out how to live a righteous life. And it begins with seeing our need for God's mercy and love. We're kind of like this joke about these two math books that we're talking about. And one math book said to another, you know what? I'm full of problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My wife said, it was just an okay joke. And I was, it was the Virgin Mary one I used last week. So if you didn't hear that one, you should have talked to people that were here. Anyway, all of us here come to church full of problems and sin. And what does God do? God wants us to admit our sin and to see his great love for us in the cross. That on that cross, he has wiped away all of the wrongs that we have done. And then we are to live out this message of love and mercy, to practice this Christian faith. So how do we practice this Christian faith here in America, in our political system? Well, it means that we are to be involved in politics as individuals. And let's read what Paul said that we are to do. Part number two, ready? Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. And so Paul saw the Roman Empire as a necessary thing to the world to bring order out of chaos. But we've been given a lot better government than the Romans have. And we are to be stewards of this government that God has given us. We are not to be like the Jehovah Witness Church. The Jehovah Witnesses say you should have nothing to do with the American government. And so if you were a Jehovah Witness, you would never say a Pledge of Allegiance. You would never see an American flag in their churches. You would never sing a patriotic song. You would not vote. You would not serve in the military. You had nothing to do with government. We are not that way. We are to be involved in supporting our government, in being the best citizens of our nation. And we do this because this is now our responsibility. We've been given this great country to serve and to care for. And if you see in the back, you'll see the faces of people on the wall, church members who are serving in the military right now and have served. And what a great honor for our church to have young men and women 
in the Marines and in the Air Force and in the Army, serving on disassociate themselves from the society in which they live and have a part. No one in good conscience can opt out of the nation. We enjoy many benefits from being part of our country. And so Luther, 500 years ago, encouraged education, that young men and young men and women could be part of the political system. Uh, he said in his large catechism, if we want qualified, capable men for both civil and spiritual leadership, we must spare no effort, time, or expense in teaching and educating our children to serve God and to serve mankind. And that's what we are about as a church, isn't it? That we're here to teach you to love God and love others and serve the world. Serve in government, serve in the community. And uh, so last winter, I got to do something for our community. I got to jump in the lake in February. And uh, I'll get a little warm for that after the service is over. And this year, you might want to think about jumping in the lake for our country or our community. It's a lot of fun, believe it or not. Uh, talk to Nancy, she'll tell you how much fun it is. It's a blast. But if this is what we are about as Christians. We are involved in supporting our nation and supporting our community. If you uh, turn your sermon notes over, uh, one of our... Uh, Lutheran congressman wrote this. Our founding fathers certainly supported this theory. William Penn said, Through good laws do well, good men do better. Noah Webster is quoted as saying, When a citizen gives his vote to a man of known immorality, he abuses his trust and he sacrifices not only his own interests, but of his neighbor. He betrays the interests of his country. And so religion and politics do come together. So what we want you to do is to be a voter. If you haven't voted yet, get involved in the voting process. Find candidates that you support and be involved in supporting them. If there are unjust laws, you can protest against them. This is our calling as Christians to be active in our community and in our nation. And this brings up the worst Bible verse you've ever seen. If you think some bad Bible verses, look what Paul writes next. Okay, maybe this isn't so bad. Look what he says, part three. This is also why you pay what? Taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Or as Jesus says, what is Caesar's, what is God's? And we are called in the Bible to pay taxes. But we don't have to like it. Uh, Arthur uh, Godfrey said this, I'm proud to pay taxes in the United States. The only thing is, I can just be proud of half the money. <laughs> but I think uh, Roosevelt really said it well. Taxes, after all, are the dues we pay for the privilege of membership in an organized society. And so we support our government, we pay our taxes, we get ourselves involved. Even Jesus himself paid the temple tax one day. But we do this all in a mantle of love, not hate or violence. So look how Paul finishes up his idea about the Christian and government. Read that with me. Let no doubt that remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. Whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not cut it, and whatever other commandments there may be, are summed up with this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love that is no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And so as we involve ourselves in the political system, we involve ourselves as people of love and not hate. People of love and not violence. We go in the political system as little Christ, loving and serving and caring for others. And again, I like this next quote under A. A Christian must be a sign of contradiction in the world. A Christian is one who all their life chooses between good and evil, lies and truth, love and hatred, God and Satan. Today, more than ever, there is a need for our light to shine, that through us, through our deeds, through our choices, people can see the Father who is in heaven. 
And sitting up here and around the church are a bunch of our youth group members. And they're going to go to Carpinteria this week to help a little church out. They're going to volunteer a whole week of their lives. And they're doing this because of love. Because they love God. They love their neighbor. And so they're going to be serving their neighbor in Carpinteria. Telling the little children about Jesus and his love. And so this is what we do. We work as people who are loved. People under the cross. People who are forgiven. And we discipline ourselves daily by walking with God. That we might be good citizens. And this walk with God is difficult. And so look at that last quote. People do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves with thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. And so Jesus wants us to be the best citizens. And the best citizens are those who continually come and see that they are loved, that they are called to serve their fellow man. Let us pray. Lord God, help us all here see that we've been given a wonderful government to care for. Help us to support our political leaders. Help us to be involved in the process. Let us always do it, though, with love and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.